Today I'm going to talk to you about cognitive load theory. This is a pretty complicated subject, something that I'm really only going to be able to give you a good overview on in this in this short period of time, but hopefully this will give you a, a little bit more of a clearer idea as to what it is. So when we talk about cognitive load, we're talking about what kind of mental effort we have to use to process things in our working memory. John Sweller developed this theory in the 1980s, revised it some in the 1990s, um, and he, he believed that learning happens best under conditions that are aligned with our human cognitive architecture. And so knowing a little bit about human cognitive ar architecture will help you understand cognitive load theory. And so there are two types of memory. We have working memory and we have long-term memory. And the working memory uh, is that short-term memory, something that is concerned with that immediate perception of things that we're dealing with. Things that are in working memory, that short-term memory generally lasts 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, long-term memory, that data is stored for a longer period of time. And so cognitive load theory has a few assumptions. And one of the assumptions is that the capacity of that working memory is limited. George Miller and his information, information processing theory was something that Sweller based a lot of this theory on, and that is that our memory span can handle seven plus or minus two uh, chunks of information, and that it's easier to remember things if we organize those chunks. And so when this information is coming in to our working memory, it's coming in in a couple of different ways. It's coming in visuospatial and it's coming in phonologically. And our brain processes those two things differently. And so if we use those channels uh, effectively, then we can help with that learning process. And that kind of ties together with another connection that I'm going to explain in just a little bit. So the second assumption is that long-term long memory, the capacity is vast, essentially infinite. And that when we're making these connections in our long-term memory, forming sets of schema, those connections that we make kind of ball up together and become one of those seven plus or minus two chunks. And so the more that we can build those connections in our long-term memory, the more we can handle in our working memory at one time. Third assumption deals with that there are three different types of cognitive load, three categories. First one is intrinsic, and the intrinsic con cognitive load is just the complexity of the learning experience, whatever the topic is. And there's some argument over whether this can be affected by uh, instructional design. Just my basic understanding here is that, you know, if you're learning something new and you have no schema built up at all, it's going to be more complex. And so if you're a novice at something, it's going to take a little bit more effort to learn. If you're an expert or have some level of expertise, that means you have that schema built, or at least some level of schema built. And so maybe the intrinsic load is a little bit less. So I'd like to think that, you know, that intrinsic uh, cognitive load can be affected, but it's more by the learning process itself. A uh, second type of cognitive load is extraneous, and this is the non-relevant, ineffective stuff, the stuff that does not contribute to the learning. So it could be environmental, it could be the design itself is causing extra load. That is the extraneous load. And then we also have germane load, and this is the good stuff. This is the effective stuff, the stuff that helps us build the schema. It's it's the the real details of the of the learning process. Talked a little bit about a connection here with the dual channel. The connection is with the multimedia learning theory by Richard Mayer, and actually he Mayer and Sweller and Moreno uh, Moreno um, developed the multimedia learning theory based on the cognitive load theory. Basically, taking this cognitive load theory and applying it to 
more modern multimedia learning theory. And three of the things that, that he talked about, dual channel, limited capacity, and active processing, these are things that, that Sweller brought into his revised cognitive load theory later in the 1990s. So what does all this do for us with instructional design? My synthesis of all of this is that the goal is, is that we want to minimize the extraneous stuff the extraneous cognitive load, and we want to maximize the germane cognitive load. And when we do that, we create this learning environment where that schema can be formed. And the more that we put ourselves and our learners in that situation, the greater the schemata comes, and, and we store that information, we become more expert, which then lessens the intrinsic co cognitive load, which frees up even more working memory, and, and so it, it feeds off of each other. So how do we do this in instructional design? We can do this in a number of different ways. We want to make sure that we eliminate unnecessary information. If we want to talk about the clavicle, we're not going to give a skeleton, a full skeleton with all the parts labeled. We're going to focus in on a piece of the skeleton with the labels nice and clear and understandable. We can help our learners by organizing chunks of information for them. And if you can find easy ways to remember things and organize them that way, then those chunks are more easily processed by the working memory. When you're uh, narrating a presentation, you're not going to want to read the information on the screen to them because then the brain is trying to process what, what it's seeing as well as what it's hearing. And if it's not exact, then the brain tries to do different things. So as I bring this to a close, I want to think about some of the things that I want to investigate further. I'm certainly interested in how is cognitive load measured? Does the mode of delivery of instruction have a connection to the cognitive load? For example, is game-based learning something that involves less cognitive load, more cognitive load? Does it have any correlation at all? I'm interested in the concept of novice versus expert and how that affects the learning process. I'm interested in student self-regulation. Is the cognitive load affected when a student chooses to learn a certain thing? When, when they feel like they're ready to learn it, does that affect it at all? So I'm going to look into the works of Sweller and Mirrenbauer and Poss and uh, investigate more about cognitive load, cognitive load theory, and, and the various categories. But now I know that when I get a headache from uh, learning something new and I'm feeling that overwhelming feeling, I have a better idea of why that's happening based on my understanding of cognitive load and cognitive load theory.